Would you open your Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 4? Uh, after the, uh, you know, we fast forwarded last Sunday to go to the end of 1 Corinthians to focus on Christ and his resurrection. We're now, if you're visiting with us today, we're doing an expository study, verse by verse, chapter by chapter study of 1 Corinthians. So we're going back to where we left off. So this is 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, and the message is called Pride, Humility, and the Grace of God. Um, in this passage, Paul is teaching about how the church should view its leaders, which is so, I mean, the timing of where the Lord has us and the training of new leaders, so that how, how you view your current leaders, how you should be thinking and praying and viewing future leaders. So Paul is talking about that um, in order to build a better foundation for the church to grow upon as it grows upon Christ, the, the foundation of foundations. So this is because, so, so it's not just lessons on leadership as though it's us and them, right? It's not just kind of this, okay, we're, I see what they're supposed to be like and nah, they better be. It's not, it's not like that. Um, there's accountability, sure, but it's grace-motivated accountability. Um, the reason we're to pay attention to what the Scripture is teaching about what, you, what God calls for in a leader is because except for the gift of teaching, everything he calls for in a leader, he calls for in you, too. And isn't it great to have some examples of what the work of God's grace can do in a hardened, formerly hardened, sinful heart. Isn't it great to have examples? So that's what Paul is doing. Um, as we read this morning, here's what I want you to be looking for. Please look for how Paul warns the Corinthian church about self-exalting pride. So I'm not just going to use the word pride. Let's, let's, let's let, add a little seasoning to it. Self-exalting pride. Let's also pay attention to how he encourages self-forgetting humility and how remembering the grace of God is the key for all of it. Amen? So would you join me as we read 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Hear the word of the living God. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. For I'm not aware of anything against myself. But I'm not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? And if then you received it, why do you boast as if you didn't receive it? Heavenly Father, would you speak to us in a heart-changing way? Lord, we don't want to be like the person who looks at himself in the mirror and, and uh, sees some things that maybe need to be changed and then walks away from the mirror and forgets what he looked like or what she looked like. God, we want to see where, where your grace is at work in our hearts. And we want to be doers of the word and not just hearers so that we could grow more and more in the likeness of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and that the world could see Christ-centeredness in our, in our evangelism, in our gospel proclamation, and also Christ-centeredness in the kind of people we are. 
So we love you. We need you. Would you fill us with your spirit for this task? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you know, most people know the golden rule. It's from Matthew 7, 12. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. Amen? That's a, that's a great thing. Uh, many people also know the great commandment, and that's from Matthew 22. The great commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. That's the first and great uh, commandment. And then he says that there's a second like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Doesn't mean you need to love yourself first so then you can love your neighbor. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that you and I are all too familiar with what it is to love ourselves. We do that without thinking about it. And God is saying, I want to transform your love to where that's the way you're loving other people. As, as, as focused are, as you are on your own care, I want you to get your eyes off yourself and on to someone else. Two wonderful golden rule and wonderful great commandment. Well, I want you to take just a minute and I want you to think about the current state of our union in the United States. I want you to think of all that we're facing in the United States. I want you to think about the climate of our current culture, morally, spiritually. Um, if our current cultural climate could write out a new rule, or a new commandment that described the culture's greatest value. What do you think it might be? Oh, you guys are so good. Yeah, I wish I could hear. I don't have. I know voices said something, but I don't. I couldn't hear. Do as thou wilt. Thanks, Brad. Oh, you didn't say. It. Oh, there does you. Look, Garrett's being humble. Garrett's saying. Yeah, that's a great answer. That's a great answer. It would be very similar to what I'm um, uh, proposing to you. I think the culture would even want to give it a name. If there's a golden rule, you know how the culture is. They think they're better than God. Let's call it the platinum rule. Maybe, it's, maybe that's what we could call it. I would just call it the foolish, the fool's golden rule. And this is what I would say, suggest it is. Thou shalt not judge me. Hang on, I'm not done. But I can judge you anytime I feel like it. I think it's one of the most prized values in our nation right now. And I think Paul is wanting to alert us to it. I'm not concerned that this is the way you're living. I'm concerned that we, we will we'll leave here today and we will be baptized afresh in that cultural climate. And it's just so easy to be conformed to the image of the culture than to the image of Christ. Since Adam's fall into sin, mankind has not done very well at judging anything. Have you ever notice that? Think about Adam's first two declarations or accusations after he exalted himself to the throne of his own life, which is what the fall really was. He accused Eve of being the cause of the fall into sin. And that if anyone was going to die, it should be her. <laughs> right away, we, we have no clue on how to judge. And then to add insult to injury, Adam accused God as the ultimate problem because he was the one who gave Adam Eve. Well, ever since then, we have done an outstanding job being judgy McJudgersons. <laughs> I read that somewhere, I just thought. That's sort of right. It's like, it's too much second nature. It is the nature of the dead sinner, the person dead in sin. But it should be progressively not. It has nothing to do with the new nature we have in Christ. Self-exalting pride has been the soundtrack of our fallen lives. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you score yourself as someone who practices self-exalting pride, as it would be seen, there's a lot of ways, we'll go into that later, but as it would be seen through self-righteous judgment of other people. I don't want you to go, just don't go right, don't skip your family and go right into culture. I want you to be, how do you sometimes have self-righteous judgment even against a spouse to a spouse? 
or a church member to a church member. Paul didn't only speak about self-exalting pride in this passage. He also spoke about self-forgetting humility. I borrowed that phrase from C.S. Lewis and Tim Keller. Tim Keller did some work that was based on some things Lewis said, so I'm putting their names together for this. And just here's a simple quote to give you a taste of this. It's in your notes. The essence of gospel humility is not thinking more of myself or thinking less of myself. It is thinking of myself less. So we're going to see how Paul encourages that in just a minute. But I want to ask you another question. If pride is our greatest enemy, how are you doing building your relationship with your greatest friend, humility? So there's a lot of intention. I want to build intentionality right from the very beginning of this because that's what the text is calling for. It's calling for our radars to be up, to be wary of the sinful pride that still exists in our flesh and the grace God would give us to grow in humility like our Savior Jesus. Oh, God, we, need to, we want to grow in these things. How are you doing? Being be, beware of pride and cultivating humility. How mindful are you of walking humbly with God in all you think and do. And what a joy that Paul roots our success in putting off pride and putting on humility, not by trying to say try harder, but by remembering the grace of God. <laughs> what a God. But by remembering the grace of God that we have received through Christ our Savior and his work for us on the cross. So that's where we're going to go today. Main point is, is just an echo of that. God calls us to put off self-exalting pride and put on self-forgetting humility by remembering God's glorious grace. And now you be the judge if we come close to maybe the main point for this text. Here we go. Put off self-exalting pride. This is going to be in 1 Corinthians 4. There's, it's really throughout verses 3 through 7. We can get a sense of the intended redemptive effect that God has for this passage by helping us put off our pride, for helping us put off our pride. And you see it in verse 6. Get your eyes on verse 6. Paul says, he's just, here's, a, here's a, a command, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. In verse 7, he, used, he changes the word to being puffed up, to being boasting that we don't boast in ourselves or in our gifts or in our abilities. So let, let's, let's be careful. I don't, want, I don't think we should draw too narrow of a definition or an application of the definition of what it is to be puffed up or to be boasting in man or boasting in ourselves. When he speaks of being puffed up, he's, he's speaking about being swollen with pride. See, if you need an example, you've seen this Buddha belly of mine. I'm, I, I'm swollen with fajitas. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm so much swollen with pride, you guys. There's just, boy, this passage just was revealing instance after instance that I have not been calling pride. I've been calling other names. Um, so he's talking about being swollen with pride, being full of ourselves. You know, we've used that phrase before. When he speaks of boasting in men, he's not merely thinking about someone who thinks they are great or better than others or just wants to be great. He, that's included. That's included. But to be puffed up or boasting in ourselves should be seen under the banner of self-exalting pride. And that banner is a big one. And there are so many things that fall underneath that banner. So this kind of proud puffery, this kind of boasting in, in Billy, right, if you want to put, put some same letters to things, this takes many forms. It's wanting others to think highly of you, for sure. It's wanting others to think you're better or you're, or you're so important or you're more valuable than anyone else. What would we do without you? It's self-sufficiency. It's presumption. This is self-exalting pride. It's sarcasm. It grieves me when I can be so sarcastic. And later on, it grieves me. I'm supposed to be speaking faith and hope and love and life through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm just joying with the world and being sarcastic, which ultimately... It's amazing how, oh, I was just kidding in my sarcasm, but it hurts people. 
Because there's some self-exalting going on. It's a neglect of being consciously dependent upon God. It's taking credit for what God alone does by his grace. Actually, I think we could say it's any act of disobedience against God. Isn't any act of obedience is, oh, scoot over. You're not wise enough to tell me how to live. You're not powerful enough to get me what I want. Isn't any act of disobedience an act of self-exalting pride? Unforgiveness, self-exalting pride. Bitterness, self-exalting pride. A lack of gratitude. So, you see, there's a lot under this banner, isn't there? How about this, being quick to speak and quick to anger? Self-exalting pride. Not to mention lust and greed and laziness and apathy, etc. The problem, that I don't know that we, unless we have help from Scripture to be able to look at those things the way we're looking at them today, I don't know that we're noticing that enough. Because self-exalting pride, you know what? It looks like winning. A dictatorial husband who's exalting himself over his wife and, and trying to intimidate her with fear rather than faith in the Lord and love for Christ. To him, it looks like winning, doesn't it? The usurping wife who's trying to get her way through, through manipulation and getting her way through usurping her husband. It looks like winning. The disobedient child who, who just finally gets his way with his parents or her parents, it looks like winning. And I think we've got, we've, got to, we've got to raise up our kids to realize this is not winning. Our men's meetings, we need to talk about this. This is not winning. Yeah, but my wife just, she follows me. She's afraid of you. It, it looks like winning. So, you know, I'm following a little bit of the NCAA basketball stuff. And sometimes I think, maybe I should do a little coaching on the side. No, I don't know anything much about basketball. But um, I, things like this. You ever seen, like, the, the, it's the, some of the women's basketball has been so amazing. But then I see the women doing this, and they make a basket, and they're deep. <laughs> what does that mean? It, it's, I don't know what, can someone tell me what it means? Well, I know they do the ring. I can get the ring part, but what is this? You can't see me. Oh, brilliant. You couldn't have come up with something better than this? I can see you. Oh, my gosh. You know what? I mean, because I did some coaching. You know, when we worked with our kids, we would call it acting like a gorilla. You will not act like a gorilla. You will not act like you didn't have parents who changed your diaper. You will not act like you didn't have grandparents who gave you your first basketball or your parents who, who bought you your first Nikes or Jordans or whatever it is. You will not act like you didn't have you, you didn't have coaches when you were five years old that invested their time in you. You will not act like you're the only one on this team. You will not act like there's not trainers and strength coaches. And you're not gonna act like that. But do you know what it looks like to young people? It looks like winning. And it's self-exalting pride. And here we are as a church. We're just, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Oh. You know, here's what we need to tell our kids. They're doing this. Their soul is shriveling. That's what pride does. It's not, it may look like it's accomplishing something temporarily out here. It's shriveling the soul. It's shriveling the soul. It's, it, it's, it's draining life from them. It doesn't feel like it while the cameras are on. But you know how many athletes are, have, de they're, I mean, the depression amongst athletes and the pressure. I met with a couple of baseball players the other day that my son is coaching. And I asked them how I could pray for them. And, and this is at a Christian school. They said, Mr. Rays, 
Would you please pray the performance, the, the demand for performance, it gets to us. It does get to us. But it looks like winning, but it's shriveling the soul. I want you to picture it's graphic, so please forgive me. I, I, I heard a story of in Antarctica, in the, you know, Alaska, where the, there's frozen tundra and there's just, a, you know, it's cold more than it's warm. <laughs> um, how farmers or ranchers, you know, they, they'll have wolf problems. They'll have coyote problems, wolf problems. And they'll, they'll go for the chicken, right? They'll try to get in the chicken coops. And one of the ways that farmers try to prevent the chickens from the wolves from getting eaten by chickens is they would get a two-edged sword and they would put chicken blood on the sword and they would put that sword in the in the ice and then they'd go to bed and every morning there'd be dead wolves out there and i want you to picture what this i want you to think of this as i want you to think of the the two-edged sword and and blood as getting your way a self-exalting pride like i'm winning here I'm getting what I want. Those, the, the, what, they, what they say is those wolves, they, they start, first they're licking the blood, but the, the sword is cutting their tongue all to pieces. And the more, the, the more, but there's more blood. So they feel like, well, this is great. I'm, I'm, I'm attributing conscious thought to a wolf. <laughs> I'm sorry. In their instincts... The, the, the more blood, the more they're ravenous about that. And they're licking and licking, not knowing that they're, they're drinking their own blood. And then they pass over, pass out and die. I think that's what exalt, self-exalting pride can do to our human heart. It's important. This is so important, especially when it, we're talking about what a leader is supposed to be, what, what Christians are supposed to be like. So specifically in our text this morning, Paul highlights this self-exalting pride in how people use their judgments of others and even their judgments of themselves as compared to how God judges us. He's the only one who can accurately and righteously and mercifully render those judgments. So in keeping with the theme of judgment, verses 3 through 5 give us what, what we could call maybe three courtroom scenes. Maybe that helps you maybe, maybe remember it a little bit easier. So let's look at three courtroom scenes. The first is in verses 3 and 4, and we can call this the court of public opinion. And did you see how Paul really kind of frames it that way? He says, but with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. Paul has been tried in the court of public opinion at Corinth. How do we know? Well, here's one passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. We hear the judgment, the self-righteous, self-exalting judgment of the Corinthians. And they say, his letters, oh, they're weighty. But his bodily presence is weak. And his speech of no account. He writes well, but when he has to speak publicly, he can't preach himself out of a wet paper bag. He looks weak. He looks wimpy and worthless. Why should we listen to Paul when we have some really exciting preachers like Apollos to listen to. Or worse, Apollos is great, or worse, listen to the culture and listen to the style of the culture and the drama and the entertainment of the culture even though they don't say anything. There's no truth to what they're saying. God gives us his word, and it's filled with truth and changing of our hearts and our lives. I'm sorry, that's probably because of me. Precious baby. I'm sorry. Let's, let's dig a little deeper here. So he, we hear about how they're judging him. And let's make sure we're understanding what Paul's not saying here, because this could really be taken out of context. He's not saying that pastors should never be judged, okay? Oh, he's not saying that. And we would, we would be stuck on a horrible island if you, as our brothers and sisters, did not care to bring a word of correction when we need it. So we'll talk about that in a second. When I was brand new to the faith, I was taught 
that we should never speak bad about or question pastors. And the proof text that they used was in this Old Testament passage that said this, Thou shalt not touch God's anointed. Anybody remember that? A couple of you? Yeah. I believe that. And so then you start getting this pedestal pastor thing. And, and, and then everyone goes, they're shocked that as this pastor is pedestaled and, and he's, he's draped with the success and adoration of his people, that so many of them fall. So but Paul is not saying that pastors should not be judged. Uh, the New Testament teaches us that pastors are to be judged in both the areas of their character and of their doctrine. So when, we, when we're presenting new potential elder candidates to you, the, the Bible guides us as to how should we view them, how, which, how should we view the next generation of leaders. And so we examine their character. Are they growing in Christ-like character? We examine their doctrine. But those judgments are not to be done by self-exalting, proud people who render their judgments as though they're full and final. Have you ever had anybody do that to you? You've struggled in an area of your life. And it may have involved sin. It may have been that you've hurt someone. Or it may have been that... The, and, and there's somebody in your life that they look at you and it's the, 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 the countenance, the, the way their eyes look. It's this look of, you'll never change. I know because my judgment is full and final. Oh, God forbid that any Christian have that heart. And I'm sorry if you've experienced that. You know the good news is? In Christ Jesus, we can all change. Even an old dog like me, we can all change. That's the good news. That's the good news. But there's so many times that people say, I, no, no, it's happened too often. He can never change. He can never get better. He can never be more humble. He can never be more loving. He, couldn't, he can't preach better. It's not just that, though. The other thing is, it's easy to say, to make a judgment, assuming you know what's in the person's heart. You're not God. There's only one person who knows their heart. And that's the Lord. It'd be easy for, you know, Jen and I were talking over the past couple days about, I'm still, so this is an area you can hold me accountable to because I'm, tr I'm wanting to listen better to her. I'm wanting to cherish her, according to Ephesians 5, through listening. Why is it that, wouldn't you say? Give me a little feedback here. Amen. <laughs> Thanks, honey. That's really the only wife I really should hear that, I needed to hear that from. Um, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm grieved that I think I'm cherishing my wife, and yet again and again and again, she says, you didn't listen to me. And so yesterday, was it yesterday, Friday, we were talking about that. And I said, oh, well, sweetheart, it's not that I don't love you. Um, I'm preoccupied. I'm just preoccupied. You know, I get worried about the church. I get worried about failure. I get worried about all this. And so this morning, as I'm finishing this, preoccupied, schmickamockified. <laughs> Sweetheart, I'm proud. I'm proud because I think somehow that I can change whatever I'm worrying about and that I don't need the Lord. I'm proud and that if I can figure out what I'm worrying about, maybe people will like it or like me better. So it's pride that's at the root of that. So now, wouldn't it be easy for Jan to, to just go into Judgy McJudgerson mode and just say, he'll never change. I know what's in his heart. He doesn't give a rip about me. You all have, all of the marriages here, you all have your own things that are like that. You all have your own things where one spouse is falling short in an area. The other spouse, uh, in, instead of recognizing, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I don't want to just forgive my spouse. I want to be a forgiver. 
It's not even an issue. My nature, I want my nature to be a forgiver. Now, I'm not going to, that way I'm not counting how many times I've forgiven them. I'm a forgiver. That's what forgivers do. We just keep forgiving. And my second greatest joy is to help you overcome it. Oh, but it'd be easy, right, to just go, I'm doubting their love for me. So we, we can't do that as believers. God changes the heart. God knows the heart. Sometimes change can take a bazillion years, and God's not frowning. So that's, that's, that's what Paul is, is wanting to get across here. Um, this kind of judgment or correction is to be an act of love that believes that the work God began by his grace, he will complete by his grace. So I want to ask you, when, when, when you feel some self-righteous judgment rise up, well, let's, okay, let's deal with it. How can this be turned into, Lord, what would you have, how would you have me respond to this? And instead of condemning someone to this isolated world, because when I judge someone, I don't offer my help. I don't know about you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to judge you and let you work it out. And when you fix yourself, come back and see me. I don't want to do that. So well, ask yourself, I, I can, I, is this self-exalting pride? You know one of the ways you'll be able to tell? You're not going to do anything to help the person. So that's what Paul is talking about, what, what pastors and what church leaders are supposed to be like and how they're to be judged and evaluated. Paul's not saying that he could care less about what people think. That's what, how this has been interpreted as well. As though, as though he hardened his heart toward people. I get concerned. I get concerned. If you tell me, I don't care anymore what people think, we're going to have a talk. Because I'm concerned that you're not caring what people think is another way of saying, my heart is hardened to people. We're never to foster a hardened heart toward people. It's been said, pastors are to be examples of men with tough skin and tender hearts. Yes, we have to go through hard things. But let's endure it by the grace of God and not allow our hearts to harden. So Paul is not saying that. And there's this also, there's, it's, it's not just tough skin, tender hearts. It's a tenacious desire to grow. Some of us probably need to pray for that this morning because our, our, our desire to grow in holiness and maturity maybe has waned some. So maybe this is a day to say, oh God, please fill me afresh with your spirit. I want a tenacious desire to become more like Christ, which means you want to learn from your failures and your mistakes. Did you ever hear that precious woman missionary? I, can't, I could not, I was Googling, I couldn't find it. She's walking with another friend of hers and and up comes another lady to them. And this lady reams the woman missionary out. She just hateful, critical, accusing of every, all of this issues of wrongdoing and not caring and not being there when she needed her and all of these kind of things. And this, this woman's, this missionary lady, she just, like a countenance, the, the person said her countenance was not there not furrowed or not, you know, it's not, you know, not doing this <laughs> kind of thing. Um, she said her countenance was loving and bright. And after the woman finally finished, so the two of them began walking down the trail a little further, and the, the friend of the missionary said, I don't know how you stood there and took that. I was about to ream her out. Because so much of what she said wasn't true of you. And this lady said, oh, well, by God's grace, maybe some of it wasn't true of me. But I'm so much worse than she spoke of. And I want to grow. And I want to grow in grace. God's grace is greater than our sin, isn't it? Oh, yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. So he's saying that he cannot let the self-exalting and hurting or inaccurate judgments of people determine his identity. So that's what he's talking about, about being judged. I can't let even their self-righteous, self-exalting judgments, I can't let that shape my identity. I can't let it harden my heart. 
I want to continue to be a good servant of Christ, a galley rower on the bottom row, and a steward of the gospel. J.R. Vassar wrote a book, a little book called Glory Hunger. <laughs> really interesting book, and how he takes the fall and weaves this, how the fall affected us and gave us this glory hunger, not for God, but for self. And listen to this quote. This is so good, and I hope this will help people today. God put in your heart the need to be justified. And until you are able to stand before him justified in Christ with the verdict of being fully loved and fully accepted, you will never be truly free from the courtroom of human opinion. Until the opinion of the one who matters most actually matters most to you, you will never be free from your unrelenting glory hunger. So it's not just the court of public opinion. He goes further and he talks about his personal opinion about himself. I don't even judge myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. In the courtroom of his own conscience, he's, his conscience is held captive to God's word. And while he's unaware of anything specific that would disqualify him as a servant or a steward of the gospel, he knows that his own private verdict is hardly any more reliable than what the, the Corinthians are accusing him of. He can't, he can't just base his view of himself by his opinion of himself. It can't be that way. It has to be. What saith the Lord? What has God said? And is my conscience held captive to that? Am I being responsive to that? So he's saying that I'm not, I, I don't know at this moment that, that there's this besetting sin that I need to deal with or to confess. But he's saying, but that's not where I stop. I don't stop with my own self-approval. I go to the Lord and I say, God, if there be in, in me any hidden fault, if there be anything unclean in me, oh God, show me and change me. Verse five, he says, he tells us that what matters most to him is how God views us in the courtroom of heaven. And that's the third courtroom. And he says, don't pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. And this ends in a, such an a, amazing and I think surprising way. Then each one will receive his commendation from the Lord. And what he's saying there is don't pronounce self-exalting or self-condemning final judgments upon others. Don't do that to yourself before the Lord returns. He will judge according to the finished work of Christ on the cross. We should probably be judging that way too. According to the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, yes and amen. According to the counsel of his word and the ever-working grace that now rules how he sees us. He doesn't see us according to our sins. He sees us according to our Savior and what he's done for us. And on that day, Paul says, the, hidden thing, the things hidden in the darkness will be exposed and Christ will uncover the purposes of the heart. At the end of verse 5, you'll see how Paul was able to live free from the fear of, of man, free from the fear of others' opinions or views of himself. Because he's looking not for the approval of man. He's looking for the commendation of God. Do you see that? It's commendation of God that I'm, I'm wanting and needing. His opinion, God's opinion, is the only one that ultimately matters. So his question is today, will my conduct, will my thoughts receive the well done of my Redeemer? Well, that's such a wonderful thing to think about. And the other thing about this in this context, the things now hidden in darkness, the context just doesn't really go toward, oh, that's all the sin and evil we do. The sin and evil was judged in Christ already. This is talking about all the countless works of God's grace that no one else knew about and that even you lost track of or were not aware of. And in the final judgment, you will not hear condemnation. You will hear commendation. That's, that's amazing. If you're anything like me, I am so aware of all the reasons I should be condemned. And to hear that by the blood of Jesus, the work of his word, the power of his spirit, and his ongoing grace, and that disposition he has toward me, he's going to commend me? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
Then Paul goes in to talk about self-forgetting humility. And he says, the first thing I want you to do is study the example of others who model Christian humility. Paul says, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us. We, we do. We learn so much from the example of others. And there are some things that it's helpful not to just read about. How do you say it? That some things are, are caught and not just taught. And I think humility is one of those things. I get a kick out of the progressive insurance tagline. Progressive can't keep you from becoming your parents. <laughs> but we can protect you when you bundle your home and car <laughs> insurance with us. And that commercial... One of them is, you know, there's the, like the teacher guy, the professor, professorial guy, and, and there's a guy in there at the dumpster, if you remember this one, and the guy's bringing his old car, the floor mats from a car, and he said, and the, and he's, the guy's encouraged it, throw it away, throw it away, and he goes, well, I might, we, we could maybe use these later, and he says, um, do you have the car anymore? No. But <laughs> we can maybe use these later. The whole point of it is, guys, get ready. Because you, too, will be finding yourself saying, I'm sounding like my dad. I'm sounding like my mom because the power of example. It is powerful. Parents, let that be some hope for you. That realization, that light bulb may not come on for years. But the power of a godly life. It affects kids. It affects kids. And so that's what Paul is saying. Let's be learning about this from other people in the body of Christ. And he uses Paul, he uses himself and Apollos as an example. And how does he describe their life? Remember what he said. I didn't come with lofty speech or wisdom. I came in weakness and fear. Uh, I came in trembling. I came dependent upon the grace of God alone. I didn't come as some hero, some muscle man, some, some rescuer. I, I came as a gospel witness. He calls himself a mere farmhand planting the seeds of the gospel. He calls himself just a construction worker laboring on God's building site as the church arises on the foundation of Christ. He calls himself a galley slave, an under roar, roar, <laughs> roar, <laughs> under rower, pulling his oar to the beat of the master's drum. He's a household steward, a slave in a great estate, dispensing the riches of the gospel to both the lost and the saved. And in every instance, Paul is seeking to show that Christ and the cross is both the center of his teaching and the center of his life. And it's a wonderful thing to behold. Hebrews 13, 7, I think this is in your notes. I hope it's in there. I don't have it highlighted. Remember your leaders who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Yeah, but I'm not like them. They've got this person now. That, that's, not, that's not what it's saying. Look at the grace God gave them to humble themselves when they're accused. Look at the grace God gave them to persevere when they wanted to give up. That's not personality types. That's the grace of God. And he'll do that for you. C.S. Lewis talked about imitating the, the faith or imitating the humility you see in other people. First and foremost, we imitate it in Christ. But this is so good too. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity makes a brilliant observation about gospel humility at the very end of his chapter on pride. If we were to meet a truly humble person, Lewis says, we would never come away from meeting them thinking, oh, they were so humble. <laughs> They would not be telling us, they would not always be telling us that they were a nobody. Because a person who keeps saying they're a nobody is actually a self-obsessed person. The thing we would remember from meeting a truly gospel humble person is how much they seemed to be totally interested in us. Because the essence of gospel humility is not thinking more of myself or less of myself it's thinking of myself less. So good. So to put off pride and put on humility, we need to foster a culture of humble service that promotes and creates future spiritual leaders who embody it for us. And then he talks about submitting to the word of God. Did you know that is an act of humility? 
I, I hope you guys in your devotions, I hope at the end of your devotion, you are submitting yourself to what you've just read. God, is there a command for me to keep in this? Is there, is there, is there something that, uh, forgiveness to offer, a patience to grant? I, is, what, are you, what are you calling me to? Because that in its very essence is humbling yourself before the Lord. And so the way Paul puts it here is that you may learn from us not to go beyond what is written. Submit to the rule of the word. These people are gospel governed is what Paul is saying. And they can't be gospel governed and be proud. There's, there's, there's a humility that goes with being governed by the gospel for the glory of God. So he's talking to them about don't go beyond God's word about the cross being central and saturating. Don't go beyond God's word and saying salvation is Jesus plus something else. Don't go beyond the word. Don't go beyond God's word in knowing that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Don't go beyond God's word in thinking we're responsible for the results of sharing the gospel rather than God giving the growth. Don't go beyond God's word in saying that what makes a person spiritual is their gifts. Don't go beyond God's word. That doesn't say that. It says what makes someone spiritual is being born again by the grace of God and the love of God. That's what makes them spiritual. They're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. It's not their gifts that make them spiritual. Don't go beyond the word. Being governed by God's word is a premier way to grow in humility. And I want to say, I want to shout out to Hugh who at regularly at our leaders' meetings, our elders' meetings, he was conscious, con, well, consciously, he was unconsciously telling us, he was regularly telling us, I, I think maybe I think we're preaching okay. Are we living? Are we living what we're teaching? Are we living it? I'm so thankful to Alan. Alan is practicing this in a wonderful and amazing way. Alan and Danette supporting him. That he's so governed by God's word that he's taken a season off of eldership to honor God's word in prioritizing his wife and sons. I'm so glad we have the men that God has given us so far and the, and the men that we believe are waiting in the wings. So he goes further to show us that really the ultimate way of of, um, of growing in humility is to remember God's grace. It's to remember God's grace. Corinthians wanted to highlight their differences in the world. You remember Paul says, who made you different? Who made you different? There are differences. May God more and more make our church a little bit more like heaven all the time. That there's ethnicities, there's a variety of ethnicities in our church, a variety of educational backgrounds, a variety of demographic, a variety of income, a variety of edge, just so much. Oh, Lord, let us reflect heaven. Let us reflect heaven. There are supposed to be differences in the world between Christians and non-Christians, and there are supposed to be differences between Christians. But not so that we can go, I'm better, what I've got is better than what you've got. We're different but I'm better than you. That's, I, I just wanted to see that smile. Um, I, it's, that's not, that's, so that's what he's saying. Quit the judging McJudgersons. Quit it. The, the differences are God-given and they're grace-given. So he says, so who sees anything different in you? Remember who you were. So this is just tiptoeing through the tulips of, of Corinthians. Remember, that, that we, were, we were saved by grace. Remember, there were not many wise, not many powerful, not many noble birth. We were worse than nothings, Paul said. We were saved by grace and mercy. Chapter 1, God chose them by his grace. Chapter 2, God revealed himself through Christ and his word. They didn't find God. God revealed himself to them. They, chapter 3, any growth they've experienced they're due to God growing. Everything is owed to God and his grace. So let's close with this. this. <laughs> Spurgeon explains this better than I ever could. In one paragraph, we probably should have, I probably could have just read Spurgeon's paragraph and we could have had a 10-minute sermon. <laughs> Eric, would you come bring the team? Guys, would you stand as we read this? Oh, believer, 
learn to reject pride, seeing that you have no ground for it. <laughs> so great. Whatever you are, you have nothing to make you proud. The more you have, the more you are in debt to God. And you should not be proud of that which renders you a debtor. Consider your origin. Look back at what you were. Consider what you would have been but for divine grace. I thought about that this morning. I think I, I, think I probably would be, I, I think I could be a drug addict, if, if not a drug addict on prescribed medicine. Enslaved to, to lust and porn. Just all the things from my past. What I would have been were it not for divine grace. Look upon yourself as you are now. Doesn't your conscience reproach you? Don't, you? don't your thousand wanderings stand before you and tell you that you're unworthy to be called his son or daughter? And if he has made you anything, aren't you taught thereby that it is grace which has made you differ? Oh, great believer, you, had, you would have been a great sinner if God did not make you to differ. Or you who are valiant for truth, you know what you would have been? You would have been valiant for error if grace had not laid hold of you. Therefore, don't be proud that you have a large estate, a wide domain of grace. Once you did not have a single thing to call your own except sin and misery. Oh, strange infatuation that you have borrowed, that you who have borrowed everything should think of exalting yourself. And then he closes it by pointing what we'll get to in the future. He points to the gifts of the Spirit. It's already happening here. So pay attention. The, the gifts passages don't just surprise us. God, God is laying a foundation for us to be most amazed by our salvation and the grace of salvation, not the, spaz, not the pizzazz of gifts. Okay? And so even our gifts are just gifts of grace. If you have an education, thank God for the mama or the dad that taught you to read. It didn't, these, none of these things came without God giving them to you. What do we have that we are not undeserving receive? Oh, Heavenly Father, would you help us grow in our tenacity for putting off self-exalting pride, for recognizing it and putting it off. Would you give us grace for growing in self-forgetting humility? And we pray that, it, our, that our song, our herald to you, would be, it's all because of grace. So not to us be the glory, Lord, but to you be all the glory for your glorious grace.